Voyo zarucho kafaro oritz. Your progeny will be like the dust of the earth. Uforatzlo. Yomo v'kedmo. Zafono v'negmo. You're going to spread. Rashi said the chizakto. You'll be empowered to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and through your progeny. Now, the Midrash discusses, usually, offer is dust. Your children be the dust of the earth, something which is nothing much to talk about. Dust has no value. Dust is something you trample on. You want to say it's like the stars of the heaven. You want to say it's like the sand on the beaches. Kechol asvasayam. Chol is sand. Dust is dust. Dust has a certain um, very, uh, it's like a certain pejorative term. It's like denigrating. You'll be like dust. You'll be like nothing. Right? We said, you know, uh, when you do, you nullify chomets, you say it should be kafre dara. It should be nullified. It should be like the dust of the earth. As the dust of the earth has no value, identically, chomets in my eyes has no value. So thus, the connotation of dust is it has no value. Your children will be like the dust of the earth in every in every direction. This is the Midrash. Ask this question. So the Midrash answers, gives, explains, gives two answers, which has a certain positive connotation. It's a known fact that If a person walks and tramples on dust, what happens? What happens to the dust? It rises and it covers the person. Person becomes totally embedded, absorbs that dust from his feet all the way to his head. If he stamp, stamps on the dust, it rises. I mean, if you have a dusty area, what they do the Gemara in the Mishnah in, in Shabbos speaks about it. You could take water. And sprinkled the water so the dust should settle, so the dust shouldn't rise. But unless you actually add water, sprinkle water on the dust, the dust rises. That's how you keep the dust down. Your chew will be like the dust of the earth. What's the dust? It's a known fact that all the civilizations that tried to destroy us, rather than us being destroyed, they were destroyed to, through us. And they're in the dustbins of history. So the Midrash says when you have an invading army coming in wearing their uniforms and they march into the territory, as they march, the dust of the ground rises and they become totally covered by dust. The history of Jewish people is that any nation that ever trampled on us, ultimately, rather than they destroying us, they be consumed, we over, overcame them and they were destroyed through us, we overcame them. They were totally coated with us and we overcame them because they trampled on us. That's one connotation of dust. So through us, they will be destroyed. There's a similar Midrash. The Midrash says that we find the Navi refers to Kal Yusra, the Jewish people, as Evan Yisrael. We are the boulder of Israel. So the Midrash asks, in what sense are we Evan Yisrael? Evan, the stone of Israel. So it says the same thing, but it explains with a, a marshal with an allegory that in, in the middle evil times, I've mentioned this in the past, that they would have contests and they had people they were called he-men, very powerful, like Atlas, he-men. And if you were able to lift this very large boulder that made maybe a ton or more, and you were able to ride, lift it and raise it above your head, You'd win a pet purse of gold. And literally for centuries, the strongest men actually vied for this purse of gold. Nobody's able to win, win the purse. Why? Because when you lift something very heavy, if you get lift it above a certain height on your body and you get it where it's, it's above the head and you should lose your balance, the boulder crushes the person. Rather than, and the person is not able to lift it and throw it away, throw it off of himself. So the contest was you lift it and you throw it away, throw it away from your body. 
So rather than being able to throw away from the body, the boulder was had such weight, it would crush the, the this very powerful person rather than him being able to throw away the boulder. That's Jewish history. Anybody who's attempted to lift us and cast us off, rather than we being cast off, they were crushed by us. This is the meaning Evan Yisrael. Kalal Yisrael has that characteristic of Evan, that we have crushed those who tried to lift us and cast us off. That's Evan Yisrael. So that, that would be the same connotation as the dust of the earth. Anybody who tries to trample on us, not only don't they are we destroyed and go and become extinct, but rather the oppressor, the conqueror, ultimately is destroyed through us rather than we being destroyed through them. That's one connotation. We say in the Shmon Esrei, in the concluding paragraph, after we finish, we say, Right? It's the last paragraph. We say, What is it? Our nefesh be ka'ofer, like dust. So where Tosis and Brochus explains that if you take something and you try to destroy it, and even a body decomposes, the dust, there's always a remnant of that person. There's always, even the dust. So the tefillah, nafshi kofel kotiya means that Hashem should guarantee that we should have progeny forever. That even if the person dies and he's no longer here, there's a remnant of his descendants, his descendants would always live. That's ka'ofer. Just as offer, even the person decomposes, there's always uh, a certain degree of remnant left of his body, identically, nafshi kofel kotiya, there should always be a descendant of us that one's progeny should not, God forbid, become come to an end. It should always continue. This toast is in, in Baruchos we have. That's the kavona, it's the intent you have. Nafshi kofel kotiya. It's always. So, years ago, somebody comes over to me and says to me, uh, and the person was what we call a real let's, real deprecator. In a certain way, you know, a very brilliant man, but he his brilliance expressed itself in always turning something into a joke. So he came over to me, and um, he was an older man, and at the time, he must have been a man in his upper 70s, and he and he was a tremendous Talmud Chochem, this person, and he says to me, is there any illusion in the Torah for a grandchild? For a grandchild. Is there any illusion in the Torah for a grandchild? The Torah speaks about grandchildren. So in Yiddish, how do you say grandchild in Yiddish? Enikul. An enikul in Yiddish is a, grand, a grandchild. Enikul. See, so I said to him, I have no idea. I was just waiting for the punchline. No, he had something to say. He says, we find by the burning bush, Moshe sees something wondrous. The bush is burning. Vasne einen ukol. Here is what he says. The sned, the burning, the bush is not consumed. Einenu ukol. Einakol. Einakol. Here, what he says to me. So that's uh, uh, an allusion to grandchildren. Because in Yiddish, einakol is a grandchild. So I said to him, you know something? What you're telling me is a tosis and brochus. That what is a grandchild? V'nafshi kofalo koltiya. Your, your progeny will never be consumed. They will always be your progeny. You'll always have somebody in the center of yourself. So what you're saying, you're saying it as a joke, but that illusion, just as the bush wasn't consumed by the fire, the nafshi kofo koltiya means you'll always have a remnant of your progeny. They will never come extinct. That's what he said to him. So this is, boyazarcha kafara oritz. They will always be. But over here, it's even more so that whoever has tried to destroy us and they trample on us, ultimately, rather than them destroying us, we they are destroyed through us. That's one interpretation of the Midrash. Another interpretation is, now, the Gemara tells us in Tainus that Torah is compared to water and it cites many psukim. One of the characteristics of water that it flows from an elevated location or low, a low location, which is an indication of humility. Torah can only be acquired by a person who has a humble spirit, humble mind. Or 
miskayemes, the only repository that's able to retain the Torah is only if, you have, if you're humble. So that's the connotation of water. But also water is, water is life. Just as water is the source of life, identically the Torah is the source of the spiritual sustenance of the neshama, of the Jewish soul. That's Torah. If you have dust and you have, you want to make bricks or you want to give it substance, how do you give substance to dust? You add water to it. The Jewish people, if it's a kokol Yaakov, if we take the Torah, which is compared to water, and we add it to the dust, what happens? Then it becomes substance. But if you only add water to it, what happens now when the wind blows? When the wind blows on the dust, it blows in every direction. So what gives the Jew a state of permanence uh, when he's secure, that he cannot be just toppled over? It's scattered in every direction. If you have the water intermingled, mixed into the dust, then that dust becomes something, becomes substance. But if the Jew doesn't have the Torah, then you go in every direction. We could be blown and scattered all over the face of the earth. So that's the connotation of Yizarcha Kafar Oretz. We have the character, correct, characteristic of dust. But what do you have to do to guarantee it and secure it, to give it substance? You must add the water, you must add the Torah to it. And only then do we assume that permanent status, because that's the characteristic of water versus dust. Torah versus our existence. He says, the Sefarno, Boy Zarcha Kafar Oretz, Achashi Yazarcha Kafar Oretz. After the Jews are denigrated and were not valued in the world more than the dust of the earth, and he quotes a posuk in Yeshayo, but Simi Koretz Kevecho. Your belly will be on the earth, being pressed to the ground, and it'll be like something outside those who walk over it, you, when you're going to be walked over. Meaning the level of persecution and discrimination will be like you're just being stepped on, you're being trampled upon. When the Jews will reach a level, which will be the ultimate level of denigration and loneliness in the eyes of the world, that's when it's about to explode. You're going to actually be empowered to take over the land. At the time of the coming Mashiach, what's it's going to happen? The ultimate future redemption. When the Jews are going to be seen in the most lowly state in the eyes of the world, that's when it's going to explode. That's all of a sudden they're going to be shocked. The Jews are going to expand and be magnified and be recognized and be empowered by Hashem to take over the world. So that's the connotation. Your children will be kafar orits. Ultimately, they'll be seen in the most lowly level, having no value whatsoever. And only then will the guluk happen. You know, it's interesting. We find by Yosef, he was a slave. He was in a dungeon for 12 years. And it says, Achrei, it says, after two years, what happens? And after two years, remember, he was supposed to be in prison 10 years, but because they asked the wine steward, he said two words for each year where he spent another two years in, in prison. So altogether, Yosef was in prison for 12 years. Right, Acher, it says, Ach, it says, after the two the two years ended, Ufar power begins dreaming. And he has these dreams where no one can interpret the dreams. And all of a sudden, the wine steward pipes up. And what does he say? There's this slave, this Hebrew, this lowly, whatever it is, imbecile, and he denigrates him to the nth degree. And he has the ability to interpret dreams. What does it say? They rushed Yosef out of the dungeon. They groomed him. They gave him a new set of clothing. And what happens? Within moments, he gives the interpretation of what happens. One moment, he's 
in the depth of 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 the of, of of deprecation, and then what does he become? You know what happens? Within moments, he becomes the viceroy of Egypt. You hear this? So the Sefarno over there says, Yeshua Hashem carify him. The Yeshua of Hashem will come about like a blink of an eye. How long does it take to blink? Just as Yosef was rushed out of the dungeon, and it says, they groomed him. And he had a change of clothing to be able to stand in the presence of the king. And within moments, he became the viceroy. That's going to be the transition of the Jew from the lowliest level. All of a sudden, we're going to be esteemed and revered in a position of power to take over the world. That's the Sephardah over there by Yosef. That's forecasting. That's going to be the future. But that lies within the blessing within the characteristic only when you will reach that level of lowliness like the dust you'll be pressed to the earth not to be seen anymore have any value than the earth itself then and when we reach that level immediately the, the Yeshua is going to come that's going to be Yemosa Mashiach you know it's interesting I mean during World War II we nearly reached that level because if you read even American behind the scenes in the United States, the political position of the United States was the State Department, Roosevelt, and there was a Secretary of State, his name was Hull. They knew the Jews were being incinerated and going to the gas chambers. They couldn't care less. There was an article recently on Churchill. The English knew exactly, and they asked Churchill, should they actually continuously have whatever they call their their spy service, come back with all the, the data about how many Jews are being killed every day, every month in the concentration camps. Churchill says, not interested. I don't want to know about it. It's not, it's not important. This was the world view. I'm not talking about the Germans. The Americans couldn't care and what and 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 the other and the Europeans couldn't care. England was was at war with the with the Germans, but it wasn't the Jews. The Jews wasn't an issue. They didn't want to hear about it. What is that? Because the Jew is, has no greater value in it than what? Than dirt. Are you concerned what's, what's going to happen with the dust, with the dirt? You sweep it out. Forget about it. And that's what Chofetz Chaim, there's a story, my Rashid Zechariah of Rachel visited the Chofetz Chaim after World War I. And he was at the Chofetz Chaim's table for Shalashudas. And World War I brought tremendous upheavals in all the Jewish communities in, in, in Europe. The villages were, were destroyed and people were actually, they were, they were homeless and they ended up in the larger cities, whatever it was. So the Chavetz Chaim put his head down and Shalosh Shudas and broke down crying. And was known the Chavetz Chaim had Ruch HaKodesh. And he says that World War I is going to be, it's child's, it's child's play compared to what World War II is going to be. There's another war that's going to happen and in terms of what we've suffered, it's child's play com compared to what's coming down the pike. And he held that this was what? This was Ikfus and Mashiach. The Chavetz Chaim says, this is the last debt we're paying before the coming of Mashiach. That's what the Chavetz Chaim held. So I'm just saying, when anti-Semitism rears its head on a global level, and we're seen at, in that lowly state, and they want to push us off the cliff, because we have no value. That's why Yazarcha Kafar Oritz. And that's what he says here in the name of the Novi. When your, your belly is going to be pressed to the ground, only then are you going to rise to become the ultimate. There's a Ramchal and Dust Funos says something interesting. What is the concept of ex nilo? Something from nothing. That's ex nilo. If you notice, he says, Many things in nature actually have a similar, it's a replication of next level. If you plant the seed, what is the process of germination? You take the seed, you put it in the ground, it decomposes, it rots to an inedible state. And when it reaches that inedible state where it almost doesn't exist, all of a sudden it starts sprouting. That's germination. It takes root. And all of a sudden, stuff, something starts growing from it. 
You take something of something, it turns, it decomposes, it rots to nothing, and all of a sudden, life grows from that. That's 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 the chis hamesim, and that's why the Gemara tells us in Sanhedrin that at the very end of time, before resurrection, even those who are whole in the grave, they will turn to dust, and after they turn to dust, immediately they can be resurrected into new beings. That's chis hamesim. You go; it's a replication of ex nihilo, nothing to nothing, and then to something. Therefore, I'm saying, you have to reach a level of literally non-existence. Like that fire or it's just as you don't notice the dust on the earth has no value. Only once we reach that level, all of a sudden then we sprout and we grow and we, we're magnified. And this is really a replication of ex nihilo, of resurrection. Have a good day. Be well.